summed it up the uh, notice was published that uh, it's timely this public hearing uh, and then the council and there'll be an ordinance that will accompany this um, to uh, recommend the approval of the uh, of those recommendations for the revisions of those three but then council then will take that up and, and uh, we'll have as many readings as council which chooses to have on that and then ultimately we'll either uh, approve that ordinance or or or, or vote it down and actually has the authority to actually modify it as well. So, That's good. yeah. And the council has 90 days after today to take that action. To approve or? Yeah, to take action. Or modify uh, yeah, or approve, deny, or, or modify. Frank, I guess I'll get started now. Uh, I have a PowerPoint. It just goes over the process. Hey, they know who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Fred Warner. I am a consultant here for the city, helping rewrite the zoning code. Fred was um, uh, initially engaged to do a diagnostic of our, uh, really our, our entire zoning program, the code, the BZAs, our boards, etc. Uh, and Fred's background is 20 years with uh, Barbara, 20 years with Cotta Falls. He's got a wealth of experience with uh, with zoning. Uh, and he did present and submit that diagnostic report and then based on that report it was always intended that we would proceed then with the revision uh, and, and uh, we recommended and council approved uh, engaging uh, Mr. Guerra to uh, lead us through that uh, revision process. So there you go. Fred. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's good that we're leading into the diagnostic report. I have a, a slide presentation and then we'll take questions about the actual amendments uh, that were they're being proposed. Uh, so, uh, starting with the diagnostic report, just to remind everybody uh, why we're here tonight, uh, is that we looked at the existing code that the city has, and we determined that it really needed updated. And but we were going to take this in a phased approach, and so the first phase is what we call code maintenance amendments, and that is uh, redoing the administration regulations in the code, uh, redoing or actually creating an enforcement and penalty section within the code. Existing code really doesn't have one in it. Uh, we are going to look at uh, some problems we see with the riparian setbacks in the code. We are gonna look at the RL district setbacks and coverage ratios. There is an enormous amount of variances in the RL district uh, because of uh, code issues. Basically, um, the code says that uh, lots have to be at least a half acre, and probably 90% of them are less than a half acre. And so when you try to do some remodeling, you want to add a room, you want to put the deck, whatever, you have to get a variance. So we want to look at that code. That's not in this part of the phase that we're doing today, or that this right now, it's the next step we're working on. And so we want to look at that RL district to see how we could allow for expansions without any variances. Uh, and by the way, all those variances are, are normally approved, they're not turned down, so uh, it's a good indication that there's something wrong with code. And then we want to look at supplemental land uses, and basically those are, um, you know, outbuildings, accessory structures, uh, swimming pools, things like that, that are supplemental to a main use. Um, and so that's phase one. That we, we give ourselves a year to try to update the maintenance, what we're calling maintenance amendments. The second phase is actually looking at creating uh, a consolidated land use code, um, is to 
is to really separate this code into an administrative section, a zoning section, a site and building design section, land division and infrastructure. And by the way, we, which is a subdivision code. What we don't have a subdivision code today. We're using some counties subdivision code. And so I think it's time that the city has its own subdivision code. So when we put the subdivision code in this, we also will have a separate um, title or separate section for property maintenance. Uh, it's in the code now, but we're going to consolidate the property maintenance information into one section. And then we would have a glossary. And basically what this does is it takes all your land use codes and puts it into one document. All your land use regulations. And you have one set of administrative regulations for it. You have one set of enforcement and penalty regulations for it. And so right now, uh, you don't have those. There's one, you don't have a subdivision code. Two, you don't have a penalty and enforcement section. And, but once you have a code, uh, you would have this one document that's uh, interrelated and that uh, would allow for a smoother uh, process of land use um, changes and developments. And then finally, uh, if in, I figure phase two would probably take a, probably a year to do. Uh, it's third phase is something a little bit different. And it's a phase that could or could not happen. And it's basically is creating some special districts with special regulations. And this is done for important areas of the city. So if you want to do something special in that area. And so um, we, we selected three, uh, and it could be four, it could be one, but we selected three when we did a diagnostic report. One was for the Port of Spanx area. They have a special district with, uh, with, with regulations for the Port of Spanx area. It would include um, commercial districts, potentially com commercial districts in there, the RL district, in the R3 district. Um, the second area is to is the Manchester Village, what we're calling it. It could be it's really more of a historical area. We're having a historic district, a local historic district <coughs> with certain requirements to protect uh, the original original Manchester. And so uh, we have some vague things in the code about that now, but they really don't have any teeth in them to, get to, to protect those. And then the third area is an area called Pancake Creek in the west area, west side of the city. And Pancake Creek is really a, a sewer district, 13, in that area there. That's how we, we got it. Is that, you know, maybe we want to uh, protect some of the area there. And so the idea is now is to create a conservation district area that, that would protect as much land as possible, but still allow for some development. And so those are special districts, I think, that sometimes are important in codes. You don't want too many of them, but if you really want to save and protect certain areas of the city, you can create those. So that is a diagnostic report. Um, so um, phase one is what we're talking about. Uh, the first part tonight is to improve and organize, and organize the administrative processes, create enforcement and penalty procedures. Uh, the next phase that we're going to start here, we actually did start it, We'll be talking about that tomorrow night. The planning Commission is to modify the RL lot setback building and coverage ratios and to revise the varying development setback um, uh, procedures. And the third is to update uh, Article 8, which is supplemental land use regulations, and specifically the repair uh, requirements. Um, the administrative regulations are very important. And why are they important? is because it really forms the basis for your code. Uh, it, it's the foundation. As you build a house, it's the foundation. It, it, it says what you can do, what you can't do. It guides all decisions. And it also uh, enforces those regulations. So uh, it, it, everything that you do in a zoning code or a development or a, a land use code would be uh, the administrative regulations would be part of your decision. And so when we look at it again, it says when things are done, how things are done, and who does what. And so think about those three as we go through this. Um, so what is code maintenance? So what we're doing tonight is we're looking at the existing Article 1, which is general provisions, Article 2, which is administration, Article 3, 
which is application procedures. And um, we're, we delayed a little bit on the non-conforming use regulations. We want a little bit more time to review that. Planning Commission did approve it. Our law director wanted some time to review it further. So we're going to take that back to the Planning Commission tomorrow night. So when it says Article 7, we're really not dealing with Article 7 tonight. However, um, it will be in Article 3. So Article 1, the main general provisions. Article 2 is now regulatory rules. And we'll talk about that. It's uh, Planning Commission um, and Board of Zoning Appeals and what their role is and what they do. Article 3 is zoning department. It's what their responsibilities are it is in this code. And so the way it is now, Article 2 and 3, you almost have to look at both of those articles at the same time to determine how things get done. And so we simplified it and said, if you go to the Board of Zoning Appeals, everything is in Article 2, from application, submitting application, to approval. Or if you go to the Planning Zoning Commission, the same thing. When you get to Article 3, if you go for uh, a zoning certificate, all the regulations for zoning certificates are in that section. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that. And eventually those non-conforming use regulations will be in there. So um, let's talk about the general provisions. What we did is we kept and updated existing provisions that were in there. We added some additional provisions uh, and we reorganized the article into new chapters. So when we look at that, if you look at the existing um, uh, table of contents, I guess, you see it separated similar to what it is on the right, um, but we just changed uh, things, consolidated some things, and now um, it, it, it's code information, code standards, general format, interpretations, uh, code maintenance and fees, authorized agent, and engaging qualified consultants. Um, and so we, we rearranged it, uh, but we did add some things. There was no, um, no information about the comprehensive plan. And so we put in there that uh, the comprehensive plan, which is a basis for rezonings, the basis for conditional use permits, it's put in there now. So it tells you that the comprehensive plan is important and it's, it's stated that we still are using the 2004, or it gets updated, it says in future revisions. Uh, the next thing is the effective date, and when we went over that, uh, we, it, it needed to be reworded a little bit so it was revised, so it, it, there was um, effective date in there. Um, what we didn't have was effective prior regulations, and there's always effects of prior regulations. It could be an application that's in the, in the process that, um, that was submitted prior to the changes. So you just have to have some verbiage about permits, subdivisions, zoning, and also annexations. Not that there will be any annexations, but if there is one, you have to figure out how it's coming into the city. So everything comes in as an R2. And then eventually the Planning Commission can look again another zoning board. Um, so we also put something in, in it's simple. It's just how the document is laid out. And this is pretty much the way it is today, but it's not stated. So everything is in articles, the, the main areas. Then they're divided by chapters and sections and paragraphs, sentences and lists. So there really wasn't anything in there. Just so um, when someone reads the code, and we want the code to be user friendly. That, that's the goal. And so if you go on the provisions, you'll see how things are laid out. That's all. Um, we also put interpretations. There were no interpretations in the general provisions. So general interpretations of sentence structures, graphics, commentary, uh, commentary tables, things like that, it explains what those things are. Uh, land interpretations um, about what designation of land and parcels, zoning boundaries. This uh, is presently in Article 4. It's not as comprehensive. And so when we redo Article 4, in the next phase, we'll take that out. But uh, zoning map boundaries, and then time interpretations. And that is simple as if I submit an application uh, on a deadline date, it has to be there by 5 o'clock. It can't be there by 7 o'clock when we close, and 
shovel under the door and send it in. So, so things like that that we really just had to put some time. And again, general provisions is basic information about processes in the code. Um, we also added something called miscellaneous code corrections. Um, that is if, if, if Barry finds a misspelled word or, or a, a duplication of words or, or it, it, it says the wrong table, and it, it, he can make those changes without having to amend the code. But it goes into full things. What could be amended? What needs to be amended and what can be modified? And then we took the fee schedules out. I think that's really a council uh, responsibility. You don't want to have to change the code if council decides to, to raise fees, for example. It just is basically, there's a fee schedule and it's a separate document. So that is basically the general provisions. But just basic information, laying out what's in the code, why it's there. And so, uh, again, we, we used what was usable, what we added information. The second article is now regulatory rules. And this basically explains planning and zoning commission duties and functions, explains board and zoning appeals duties and functions, provides planning commission and board of zoning appeals application processes, uh, introduces subdivision application processes that we didn't have, uh, and provides clear application review and decision um, processes. Um, this was the, probably the biggest changes we made. I guess Article 3 was a, a lot of changes too, but we really wanted to, to make it easy to find out how things function. So, um, so let's look at the existing um, Article 2 um, table contents as zoning administrator, planning and zoning commission, board of zoning appeals, public hearings, appeals, property maintenance enforcement. Well, the first thing is, We've taken out the property enforcement amendments. We're going to deal probably not with the board in the future the article on property maintenance. Uh, the board hasn't functioned in years uh, and, um, and it had its own set of regulations. So we've taken that out. Uh, public hearings now is not a, a separate section, but it's incorporated into each process. So, um, and so, and like I said earlier, is that you had zoning administrator, planning and zoning commission, board zoning appeals, but it just said, I mean, current code just says who they are. And then you had to go to Article 3 to find out what they do. So uh, we wanted to put everything together. So now um, the, the, the new table of contents is planning and zoning commission, zoning app amendments, and what their duties are, code amendments, uh, conditional use permits, major site and building plan, conceptual subdivision plan, preliminary subdivision plan, plot, uh, final subdivision plan, and improvement plans, vacations, and then board zoning appeals, and their duties, which are variances and administrative appeals. So when we look at the planning commission responsibility, we, 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 we're trying to incorporate uh, tables and charts into the new code. You can see uh, in, in, in the parentheses are those sections. Uh, you can see what the planning commissions Response, planning and zoning commission's responsibility is. Half amendments, code amendments, conditional use permits, major site and building plans, uh, major land divisions or subdivisions, and street or plot locations. Would you Fred, just say, let me interrupt you one sure. second. I'll, I'll try to make this the only one. Don't start. Uh, no, a really good example of, um, of how the current code was just sort of a uh, somewhat a uh, kilter. What we're doing here, the zoning amendment process uh, that is now in the administrative part of the code, of course, which is where it ought to be, uh, currently in our current code is under Article 3 application procedures. Uh, after we talk about zoning certificates and conditional use and variance and architectural design, buried at the bottom of that is the whole section on amendments. So those were the kind of things that we were trying to I mean, if you, you, you normally would look in the administrative part of it to see how you're going to amend your code, and uh, where is this at? And uh, you know, you've got to dig and try to find it somewhere else. So those were the kind of things that were sprinkled through this code that didn't make a lot of sense. And uh, uh, so no, but, we're trying to correct that's it. We're trying to make the code more intuitive. Uh, and what happens when you have old codes is that you make a lot of amendments when there's a problem. And sometimes you put a section that that um, should be something else. Trying to make an amendment here 
to put it in a new section. So, so we, we try to make it more uh, So, when we look at the regulatory boards, the additions, each, each activity has a submission process, a review criteria, public notice and hearing, information, decision making, and approval conditions. So, if you're going for a rezoning, each of those sections, each of each of those things would be under a rezone. If you go for the distribution rate, each of them would be. So we're trying to standardize things. Uh, one of the things I always hate about codes is that you have three or four different standards for different activities. And what happens is you're doing something, but you forget, you think it's another activity, and you don't follow the requirements. This way, everything's the same, pretty much the same. Those requirements are all the same. So when we look at, and I just took a little bit, I, I, I sprinkled different different activities in here. But if you look at zoning map amendment, the way everything is set up is applicability, submission process, uh, which is who can apply, uh, submittal requirements, how applications are submitted, uh, official filings, uh, what happens when an application is submitted, how it gets move forward, how it gets moved along to the next step. Um, the next thing is review criteria. Um, when you're looking at a conditional use permit or you're looking at uh, a rezoning, there is no criteria in most cases that said this is what, this is how we grade your application. This is, you have to meet these requirements. And so each of them have review criteria. They're a little bit different for each one, but what happens is when a staff report is being done or a recommendation is being made, uh, the zoning department would go through these review criteria and see if you met those things. And if you're an application, you would see that review criteria. So you'd have to, you could look at it and say, okay, do I need uh, one, two, and three? And so we, we needed some criteria of how these applications were reviewed. Oh, no, don't leave that yet. No, that's my last comment. Yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. Right here. Uh, what I want to point out here, from this review criteria stuff is extremely important for the city and also for an applicant uh, in the event that uh, litigation follows for whatever reason, uh, that uh, either the city doesn't like the decision or the applicant doesn't like the decision. Uh, when you end up in a courtroom, these are the kind of things that the court wants to know about. Okay, what was, the, was there any established criteria as to how you're making this decision? So that by itself is a big piece for everybody's benefit, not just the city, but also all the applicants as well. And the second thing, you're probably gonna say this, but I'm gonna point out, if you look at number one, you're gonna see this in the review criteria for every one of these things, whether it's the zoning code or the zoning map or conditional use or subdivisions, is the request harmonious with and in accordance with the comprehensive plan or specific area plan goal. So, it, 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 there was a, an intentional point to incorporate that throughout this code that the comprehensive plan matters, okay? And it's and, and it's really the first thing that is, is to be considered when we're considering the criteria for these applications. And you're gonna see that consistently throughout, throughout Article 2. Okay. And, and to follow up on that, that's why we had to add the comprehensive plan section of general provisions. Right. Because it's in the so the next thing is is how things were done, and so um, public notices. Uh, we have a public notice section, the public notice and hearings, and so um, the public notice and the mail notice um, remain the same, they're consistent. But we also added a posted notice. So if you come in for a conditional use permit or a lease only, there's going to be a sign that goes into the yard. And basically said there's going to be a public hearing. Um, it's really important because now newspapers are, half the people don't get newspapers, uh, some people don't read Facebook or go to the city's website, <coughs> and so if, if you're a neighbor you'll know that there's going to be a public meeting or a traditional use for a site plan. It'll be on the property. And then we also added electronic notice, so there'll be some electronic notices. Um, the city's website and any other social media that can be used there will be notice. So now we want to make sure there's public enough public notice that uh, you can't say you didn't see it when you did it. And uh, uh, the neighbors will still get others. So 
And I think it's really a compensation for the publication for this more than anything else. Um, and then it tells you where the public hearings are. Uh, one of the things that we'll talk a little bit about is that this new code gives more decision making power to the city council than what you've had before. But it will say that uh, public hearings for a planning and zoning commission and city council. There are some things that city council, it doesn't go to city council. It will just say public hearing and planning and zoning commission. So when you look at these sections, um, is that you can see everything, you know, as a resident, as a council person, as a planning commission member, you can see what that process is. And then finally, there's decision processes, uh, what the zoning the <coughs> action is, what the planning and zoning commission action is, is it a recommendation, is it an approval, um, if they can deny it, they can recommend it for a subject of uh, specific conditions, uh, they can continue consideration. And this is, I think, a site plan. Uh, city, it doesn't go to city council. Uh, but if it was city council, it would then have a list of what city council is. Uh, and then some of we have approval conditions under some of them. Uh, limitation of reapplication. Uh, if you get turned down by the planning commission, you can't come back next month with the same application, basically. If it's different for, for, for 365 days. But if you come back, with a change in the application that the planning commission said, you know, we think we could approve this if it had these changes, but we're going to deny it today. You can come back with those changes. Um, the effect of approval, um, you know, sometimes I've always seen this, uh, you approve a project, but it never happens. You, know, you, you, you give a conditional use permit, you do a site plan, and somebody wants to build you know, a restaurant or something, and nothing ever happens. Well, it can't just stay there forever. And you know, five years later, they build this. And there's a limitation to what they don't do. The uh, next thing is other required approvals. If you have a, an application that also needs a variance, it goes through that process that you can approve, but you still need a variance. So, so certain things that are a little bit different, but we go into approval conditions. And then in the table, each one we have uh, just a real small table <coughs> you can glance at in the front of each section. It tells you uh, this is final subdivision plat summary table. What staff does? The planning zone commission does it. What city council does? You can see in this the final plat for subdivision. Um, the planning commission um, has a public hearing and they recommend it, don't recommend it. Um, city council uh, public, uh, publish. Uh, published in the public hearing in the paper. There's also electronic uh, notice for the public hearing that you approve. For the, the, the and then finally, um, just want to move this a little bit. Because Article 2 now has those something with the requirements. And so, um, and we took some of this from the existing Southern County uh, process. Uh, but something that's really good, and I know Barry wanted this, and I agree with him, is that instead of coming in, the first meeting you have is a preliminary subdivision plan, which most cities have, is that there is, you're coming for a conceptual subdivision plan. So you're going to come to the planning commission and say, you know, we want to create this subdivision. And this is our preliminary plan. What do you think of it? And there, it, there's no decision on it, it's just more of a uh, uh, feedback from the planning commission, and if somebody's if, uh, residents are at the meeting, they can make feedback, and then the developer will take this back and make those changes. Hopefully, and come back with a preliminary change, which is standard plot uh, that you would typically have for development. And then in that preliminary subdivision plot, it is approved or denied by the planning commission. It doesn't go to city council. So if the planning commission approves that preliminary plot, um, they could approve it with additional recommendations. They would then prepare the final subdivision plan and improve the plan. So those are underground streets, more water management, and that whole plan would be then completed, reviewed again by zoning and other departments in the city, and then it goes to city, uh, it goes to the planning commission first. And they make recommendations to city council, and city council 
is the final decision on it. And that's not the way it's done today. And vacations, there's always road vacations, uh, partial subdivision vacations. There was nothing in there, so we added that to the process. But, um, you don't get a lot of those. You know, I, I probably in my 40 some years and probably had two or three of them in two different cities, but it does happen. Uh, the next one is, is the zoning department. We put everything that the zoning department does into Article 3. Um, and it's minor site and building plans, uh, minor subdivision, zoning certificates, zoning enforcement, and eventually more conformity to the local area. We that. Um, one of the things to, to say, and so major site approval grants goes to planning commission for approval. But if it's under 1,500 square feet, the department can approve it. And so, and so there's some standards in there. So if it's a small addition to somebody, and it doesn't, you know, it, but again, if, if it includes, if it's a, a major expansion, then it goes to the planning commission or a major building. So when we look at that the way it is today, uh, the existing, um, the existing table contents the zoning certificate, schedule fees and charges and expenses, which we're not doing that now, or the city council do that, but we'll just be reference to that. Conditional use review, variance review. Remember, those were in the last chapter we talked about, combined commission in the last chapter. Um, appeals, architectural design review. Uh, we eliminated architectural design review. It's going to be really in the site of the There are no regulations for it, it's just some information about, you know, the, like, you know, colonial or something, you know? and there, there's no teeth to it, and so when we get to, to that article, there will be more defined ways of what building design would be. Um, and site plan review, um, major and minor, you know, so whatever it is, and amendments to the zoning text and map is a major So now, it's, uh, Chapter one is zoning department, chapter two is minor site and building plan, chapter three is minor subdivision plan, uh, which we did now. Uh, chapter four is zoning certificate, chapter five is zoning enforcement, and chapter six will be non compliance. So, um, and again, uh, typically uh, there are there's major and minor subdivisions. The minor subdivisions is five lots or less. Is Typically, in you know, the revised code, it is done administratively. But we didn't have anything in the, in, in the code about that. So now it goes through this. And, um, and again, we, we included a, a little organization chart of how that's done with those sections in there. Uh, and now the submission, review criteria, decision process is the same as in Article 2. There, of course, are no public hearings and things. So it's set up just as we showed. Through Article Two, but it's it's not as detailed because there's no public uh, uh, portion of it. It's not um, so one of the big things that we did is sign um, enforcement. I was surprised when I first read through the code. There were some enforcement sections in um, uh, in different articles, but there was no enforcement section for everything. And so we added a, a chapter 300.5 that is, uh, goes over what that enforcement process is. So the first thing is if there is a zone violation that the zoning staff notices, um, they would send a non-compliance violation ticket or it could be a non-compliance ticket here. It's basically giving the person this uh, the violation within the time period agreed by the city, provide evidence that the, that the violation does not exist. So the AC something says this is only a violation, they all, well, you know, it was a temporary thing, it's gone now. Yeah, so it doesn't exist. Apply for a variance. And can this violation be allowed through a variance? So it's always a possibility. It will appeal uh, the violation. Part of one requirements. And, and so, um, if they don't do this, then it goes to the zoning violation board. And 
uh, it basically is a letter for non-compliance. Um, it states what those you know, what those violations are. That there was a non-compliance ticket. There was a ticket to care of, um, and if it's not remedied within 14 calendar days, the zoning violation action will be filed with the bargaining district court or other court of competent jurisdiction. And so, it, it it's a two-pronged approach. It's Oops, I didn't, you know, we send them a letter or send a ticket out to you, and oh, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know that I, you know, that this was a violation. And I just threw it out and the case is closed. Or I'm not going to do anything about this, you know, get court up. And, and so then that would go to Bobby Municipal Court. And so, um, and the penalties are basically what, uh, what a non-mystery would be. And so, in code, it, it, you have to have teeth to it in order to to, to make sure people follow the code. So with we'll, we'll anything, if, if you don't have any penalties, <coughs> you're not going to have anybody following the code. And, and um, this this approach, and just from my experience, is this is an approach part of the users in Title Falls and many other cities, is that you know, it gives you that chance, you know, you didn't mean to do this, and you work it out with the department, but if you don't, then there could be consequences. And so that's what this does. And right now we have to, we don't have that. I think what happens is, is there's a violation, something is built, and then we take it to court after everything's built. This way is you catch it in the beginning, hopefully, and it does, it's not gonna, it's not 100 percent foolproof, but it, it will make a difference in, in uh, maintaining uh, a community and you know, people the So um, just to close, uh, just put this together, uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, what their role is, they approve major site building plans, preliminary subdivision plats, and they recommend NAP amendments, code amendments, condition use for it, final subdivision plot applications. The Board of Zoning Appeals approves variances, and they have administrative appeals. City Council uh, approves NAP amendments, tax amendments, condition use permits, final subdivision plots, and vacations. And the Zoning Department uh, approves minor site and building plans, minor subdivision plots, zoning certificates, and non conforming and non conforming decisions. Um, and so that is in a nutshell of, of the changes. I know everybody on council had the, the full, uh, full codes. Um, here they are, trying to answer any questions. I, I've got one. Okay. Um, so all of council discussed the, the fact that this step um, was not to change any code. No, no, no action. Well, it's code, but it's more form and manner. It's more of the, the topic of how our code is going to work. There's no change in anybody's property uh, zoning in this step. Right. Um, but if we added a subdivision application process in Article 2, but or during the time, because this is going to get approved, assuming this gets approved, it's in place and we haven't done the subdivision part. Is it, is it going to be an application that you'll do here to apply for the county? Well, right now, you do that anyway. We okay. just never had any regulations for it. Okay. And we use the county so subdivision. It's really not a change it's in not, the procedure. Yeah. We would still use the county subdivision right. uh, regulations to guide us. Okay. But uh, when we get to that, hopefully next year, is that we'll have our own set of regulations. Yeah. But now we have a process to approve it. So that was when I, I, I did read the whole thing. <laughs> um, and that was the only section that made me think, okay, this might actually have an impact on somebody's property. Um, but it, it won't. And a lot of, like I said, the minor subdivision plan is, is process is a higher advice code. And one of the major subdivisions is a higher advice code, too. So um, it's, it's really just the process. And that's what's my biggest when you look at the code. I said, how, did, how are decisions made with no guidance on that? I give very little credit to that. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, 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 um, I have one. Yeah, yeah so I was just going to say that. I have two questions or two comments. Uh, one, 
with the revision of the, the structure and stuff. Are we looking at uh, altering the forms as well? Because Barry can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought like the variance forms and stuff. As an applicant, you had to submit hard paper copies, six of them to various locations. Is that something we're coming up to current day with, with you know, the electronic measures, instead of having to run all these paper copies off and distribute them out? We do require the electronic, as you probably know. The reason why we get the paper copies, we have tried uh, doing all electronic in the past, and we had complaints from the board members that, well, we want to have a hard copy that we can look at. So that's kind of why we're so, going to carry that on. So but, why why can't we allow the applicant to submit electronic? And if somebody on the board needs a hard paper copy, have an administrative staff here do it. How we could do that would be definitely considered. That way we're not putting the, the burden on the, the resident applying for it. Because, I mean, just, they can just do that through the electronic means. And, and if we do some sort of a payment process online, they don't even need to really come in. But I, I don't see it as being necessary as supplying six hard copies from a resident to the city when all of them might not be used. My, my second <coughs> comment is you know, we've got conditional uses under council approval. Is there any thought to have in temporary? permitting uses on the council as well. The reason I bring this up, I was just in a, a meeting the other day for a town north of here, where the turnpike's doing a, ma a major expansion on a, a major project on the bridge. And through the conditional per through the conditional permitting process of the administration, they uh, permitted a, a lot to be used for staging there, for the, the beaver excavating who's doing this turnpike project. And they did it under a uh, code that basically spoke to uh, a site adjacent to a, a project, like a subdivision, really some residential code that spoke to subdivisions, and you can use it an adjacent lot for your staging yard to go in the subdivision. Well, this project's a mile down the road from this, this lot. They gave them permission to use it under the zoning code for residential, and now it's created a, a lot of heartburn for the residents who live around this sub this lot that's now being used by equipment. You're hearing beepers, the engines, or everything else at like seven in the morning. Uh, what they, they found out was council had no no no, you know, no knowledge of this. And it's really become it's this quagmire we're trying to figure out how to get out of it. And it'd be nice to see something in here <coughs> that brings it to everybody's attention when there's a temporary a temporary use permit that's applied for in this type of situation. Let me look and see where that could go. I understand what you're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. If you think the temporary would be something that city council should approve? Well, when when things go sideways, council is one of years back. Right. Um, right. Sure. I don't know. Well, let me let me look at it. That's, that's a good point. Uh, the other thing was that we, your first point was is one of the things we took out of the code is instructions for applications mm -hmm. because your point is a good point. Is that if you know, if you have a static uh, like instruction manual for a conditional use permit, things change, mm -hmm. and then you have to amend the code. And so I always like is that there we say that there's an official application that you can prepare, and that official application, whether it's electronic or paper, right. it would be then <coughs> it tells you everything you need. And, and I saw that where it spoke to the official application, but. Is there anything where we're getting some guidance to alter our official application or process at least? Because um, there's, there's some stuff there I think we need to Yeah. Well, that's something that I don't think it belongs in the code. Right. I'm not saying it's in the code, but it's part of your. Yeah. No. Is there some consultation? <clears throat> well. One of the things we're going to do uh, is um, we're going to put a, um, a manual together for the planning commission. And we think we can put that in there. So. It would be how they do their business. And kind of, I didn't see, we don't have one. And most planning commissions have that in Board of Zone Appeals is how they conduct things. And maybe we can put it there. We'll, we'll look at that too. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just that, that information. It, and that's really what the city has to decide uh, if you're willing to do it or try to do it. And um, it, it, we, we started that kind of falls I think everybody will be doing it. And, and, and a lot of the zoning certificate stuff is done like problems with that. Yeah, I mean, we're doing applications online and uh, issuing certificates online now. 
and paying them. So, yeah, so, yeah it's just very fun for them. I work for everything that stays online, even the application submissions, everything. I do agree. We need to tighten up the uh, the process for the BZA, especially. So I do believe I don't like all the paperwork and staff around either. So. <laughs> but if you can get some help changing that, let me know. We can see what this council is presenting we can help with. Right. I thought it makes it so much easier, for sure. So. Any other questions? Um, one thing that I, I marked on here was the, uh, the 10 day notice. Is that enough time? Uh, everything is uh, 10 days. The putting the, the, the uh, sign in the, in the yard, uh, notifying the, the neighbors, and uh, post it electronically. Uh, is that realistically a, a good amount of time? I, I think the, we, the commission talked about that. And, and I think we kept settling is that if it's too long, then if you send notices out 14 days or 30 days, it, 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 it sometimes is forgotten about. And so we, they thought that the 10 days, and again, we talked about it, was a, a good time frame, um, the signs going up. Uh, so if it, the publication, if there it goes, it has to be 10 days, it has to be mailed out to 12, 13, 14, depending on how fast the mail is out to people. And so if it's a publication notice, so this publication notice would be at least 10 days. So, so I think I think it is for my right. just for my experience, yeah. I, I feel comfortable with it. And Jim brought up a good point. I was, I was thinking about that as well. Why wouldn't they make it like an even is it 10 business days or 10 calendar days? Calendar. So why wouldn't they make it even 14 for two weeks in case somebody's on vacation? I mean it, it doesn't oh, I know. Yeah, I mean if that's right. what you if, if everybody feels that it's 14 days. We can change it. The planning joint commission said, you know, basically, as I mentioned, the city council could make some changes in this process. But um, I don't know. We, we can talk more about that as we move forward. But if you feel more comfortable with 14 days, um, then I think you know, we should change it to 14 days. So that, that brings up a very valid point, though. Say we do, say reading through this, there was something that just glared out at me, and, and council said, this is right. How do we communicate that back? Um, is there, is there, should we talk to you and say, hey, this, this doesn't make sense? How we, how we can yeah. or through Barry? Yeah, we can go through Barry. Yeah, yeah. Right. So something, so something, something in, yeah. in this whole process comes by our desk and it looks, it looks off. And, and I, I don't know about Barry, what do you think about the 14 days or the 10 days? Are you comfortable with it? I, I, whatever, uh, council's happy with it, I, I'm happy with it. I mean, well, I'm, I'm comfortable with the 10 days because, uh, uh, the planning commission discussed it. Right? It wasn't just from a number thrown out there. They went through the process. And and they, they they're they're yeah, with yeah. And I think the, the great thing about it is the sign. I mean, that that gets the biggest attention. When you see a sign in the neighbor's yard about a rezoning or a condition to use from there, or a site plan, it gets your attention. And then it'll say that there's information here that the city can look at. Maybe not. And then they would come to me. And you know, I always, I, I think, yeah, and the letters, of course, are important, but the letters are limited to you know, the adjacent properties. Um, any other questions? Again, this is, this is the foundation for, you know, we're starting with the administrative section, and it's going to lay the groundwork. And this is a public hearing, so anybody can ask questions. Yeah. It's not limited to just us big heads up here. Big heads are big children. Well, you're big. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, Fred briefly touched on it. Is I come up with the idea of bringing a concept plan as part of the. Uh, back to my writing piece. <laughs> um, come up with the idea of the concept plan because it gives everybody another bite of what's going on. So we don't have a developer who comes in and says, okay, we have a preliminary plan, let's get this moving and then get it into a final. That gives us one extra step to look at things. So I mean, everybody that's in the city government, council, planning commission, whatnot, they have a good chance of looking at it. We get an idea of what their developer is thinking about. 
And then if we don't like that, you know, that can go back to the developer for changes or whatnot. So we have another bite at the apple that we, did, we don't have now. I, I don't. Okay. So uh, that's all I can say about that. But if, and also, just to add to that, if the original concept was so outrageous, they can come back for another concept. I don't really know what they're doing. So we can move on. Anything else? Yes. Hi. Um, Nice to see a lot of people here. I hope somebody else comments so I'm not the only one standing up. Um, uh, I want to say I think Fred has done an awesome job doing uh, organizing and clarifying the code in the sections that we've got. It's a lot more, it's a lot easier to read. It's a lot easier to write, uh, understand the processes and procedures. Um, I like the conceptual subdivision plan. Uh, I think that's a, a great thing so that we get a preliminary, the city gets a preliminary look at what somebody's proposing. <coughs> I like the physical notice on the property when that property is proposed for rezoning. Um, there are a couple of things that I'm a little bit concerned about. All right. uh, we currently have a 30 day notice for planning and zoning public hearings. The proposed zoning for zoning code changes and property rezoning requests. The proposed zoning code cuts that down from 30 to 10. I think that's just a little bit short. Um, we currently have a 30 day notice for city council public hearings on proposed zoning code changes and property rezoning. I think anything else is a public hearing. The proposed zoning code cuts that down from 30 to about 14. It's two consecutive weeks of published notice in, in the paper. Um, Currently, property owners near a property proposed for rezoning get notices mailed 20 days before the public hearing. That's 20 calendar days. The proposal changes that to 10. That includes weekend and holidays. With the way the mail runs sometimes, uh, that's going to give property owners maybe a day or two notice, potentially, for an adjacent property that might be rezoned. Um, the Reasoning for shortening these times was explained by some of the Planning and Zoning Commission members uh, as a way to speed up the process. They said developers and builders complained about how long it took. Um, okay, you can speed up the process, but I think decreasing the amount of notice by two-thirds that the public gets is a little bit short. Um, that if you're looking at speeding up the process, the current code states that after your public hearing, the Planning and Zoning Commission has 30 days to make their recommendation to council. The proposed code lengthens that to 60 days. So they're shortening the public notice, but lengthening on the other end. So that's that's my concerns about it. I did voice them at the meeting, uh, but I appreciate the chance to say it here. Thank you. Yeah, she did mention that today. My commission, again, the, the good point is that, you know, one of the things um, that we try to do uh, is keep things moving. And, and, and as we all know, whether good or bad, people want to get their projects done as quick as possible. And so I think they felt that short, shortening that process was uh, and still doable. Everybody gets their notices. But it also speeds up the process. So you don't have to wait you know, 30 days uh, before it gets to, um, in, 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 before there's a, a public hearing. Um, the other thing is that it does allow um, the planning commission, which they have now, is to table something. If you get to a meeting and uh, it's controversial, they can make the table and you have that extra time that you then make a decision on it. Or if an application gets to the department and it's not complete, then you don't accept that application until it's complete. So there are some some boundaries or, or things that off ramps to that, but it is short. The, it, the process is short. And when we did talk about it at the planning commission, they felt complicated with that is. But it's up to you. When you say 10 day notice, is, is that um uh, we mail it out 10 days beforehand, or we mail it out with enough time for it to be received by the adjacent property with 10 days. That's the way 
It should be, yes. Is I should get that notice 10 days prior to the meeting. And so um, the department would have to say, you know, it's going to take four days to get the, the mail. So, so you'd have to calculate that. But you should get it 10 days prior. Now, if you get it nine days prior, you potentially have messages. I was, you know, I wasn't here or something, and you know, I'm not going to. And you can say it was nine days. However, it does give you an out. If that sign is up, it doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to meet all those standards. It's if, if for some reason that letter is nine days and everything else is done, ten days, it's, you know, it, it, it provides that. So, so speaking to the ten days, I know we're getting into the weeds here, but speaking to the, the ten days, just follow with me here. So let's say you're going on vacation, you're leaving on a Friday. I'm using a Myrtle Beach trip, so we'll, we'll drive down halfway Friday, get a Saturday morning short drive in, and gives you more of a longer day down there. So let's just say I'm leaving Friday. I, I don't get it until Friday. I get Friday morning. I don't get my mail. I'm gone Friday, the entire week, to the next Thursday, seven days. And then you figure in the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there's ten days. I've been going, I haven't even got it. I come home, now there's a, a letter in my mail. My window is closed, and I know nothing about it until I just get home. So that's, that's my issue with the tenant. Well, let's think about it. I mean, what do you yeah. mean, Chris? I mean, there's no, um, I, you know, I'm comfortable with well, just, just I, mean, I, yeah. I, I think it just, we discussed that, and, you know, as we went through everything, it was just um, that, that, you know, that was, because we, I think we started off with a different kind of problem. We're going to be talking about this in the meeting. Yeah. It's all getting called in circle for the next two hours. Well, right now, across the board for all of the public notices, it's the same. It went from 30 to 10, it went from 30 to two weeks. Um, to me, more important would be zoning code changes. And that's something that would not be holding up a builder, because they're not going to be relying us, on us changing our zoning code for them to do development, hopefully. Uh, so you could potentially have different notice requirements for different types of amendments. The zoning code changes and rezoning the property, which will really affect that neighborhood, seem to me to be the most you know, and that's, important. That's how we had it kind of false. However, the problem with that is when our administrative assistant was, was, has happened to me a couple times, uh, was thinking, oh, the, the rezoning is the same as all the other things, and we didn't get the notice out in time. And that's why I like to standardize it. So, it, you know, if a happy meeting is 14, uh, everybody knows it's 14. It's not 30 for rezoning, it's 10 for site plan, it's 14 for the distribution permits. You could do it. I mean, it, it, I mean I'm not going to be, you know, once it comes in here, but it, I just think administratively it's easier to have a standard. So, something you have to think about. Fred, can I interject? Oh, sure. I, I, it sounds to me there's some uh, discretion in here as well. Uh, planning zoning has 60 days to make decisions. If you had that scenario where somebody just inadvertently didn't get the notice, um, brought that to planning and zoning's attention, there would be an opportunity for planning and zoning to reconvene, have another public hearing. When we get to things like zoning code amendments and those kind of things, we have another whole cycle that involves, it, it's going to go to city council now too, so certainly, you know, we're going to know about it by the time it, it reaches that. And if there's the hardship that somebody didn't get noticed and they have an issue that is really going to change the, the course of action, that, you know, there's going to be a, an opportunity to bring that issue um, that, that's sort of built into the process because it is a graduated process. Too much, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, nicely done, Fred. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs>
but the following word does it take care of one challenge to them. One of them is the original vision of what it's Yeah, so those take a those take bit when you have a passage. We don't need to put the emergency for the and I said you all out here. 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 I welcome you to the September 6th regular schedule council meeting of New Franklin. We have one, two, three, three first readings and one third reading. Oh, I don't think I did. Oh, I don't think I did. Can I have one of those? Thank you. I'll share it with you. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. And the first reading is resolution number 23R72, Mr. Cox. Thank you. We will open a finance committee meeting at 704 with all members present. Resolution 23R72, a resolution renewing the designation of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank as a depository bank for the city of New Franklin for a <coughs> year period declaring an emergency. Uh, we've been using Chase for a while now. For a long, long time. A long, long time. Um, so this is just a, a standard thing that we do with them every five years or so. Uh, questions, comments? You ever try to find somebody closer? Yeah. Closer than Chase? <laughs> <laughs> that was cute. Uh, everybody comfortable waving the three? And uh, with that, I unfortunately will close the finance committee meeting at 705. You know, may I just say something? I think Susan has really been pleased with you. I think she's mentioned several times how good they've been. Am I correct, Susan? Yes. And, and not because they're a bigger bank, because we're happy with the service that I we have with the Apple Creek, mm -hmm. but also the bigger banks have actual government departments. So they are well versed in all of our procedures and our regulations. So it's been very helpful. And the only negative is that we can't bank, you know, we can't do everything over at the bank over here now. We have to go to Barbara Center Green. But it's well, there's time to, time. to everything. And I used to be at Barbara and I'm surprised how close it is. I usually just go the back way in what, 15 minutes max? So yeah, it's not hard. hard, and usually, like, since I look <coughs> that way, I might do it on the way home or whatever. And it's, it's a nice little drive, I think. It's not bad. Not as good as it was the street, but not as bad as it could be. Well, I still love to drive. I do. I love it. Okay. I've, been, I've been told I've talked too much, right, Jay? No, I haven't uh, said that. Not to my face, let's put it down. <laughs> the next one is resolution number 23R73. David? Right now, open streets and drainage, we call it 706. We have one piece of legislation, which is uh, resolution 23R73, resolution authorizing new frame to enter into an agreement with OMH advisors to provide engineering and bidding services. For the Overture Way culvert improvement project and declaring an emergency, and the uh, proposal was for uh, forty-two thousand five hundred dollars. Right. This is um, uh, we received the. It's a two hundred sixty thousand dollar project, and uh, we were awarded two hundred thirty-four thousand dollars of that under the uh, Municipal Bridge Fund. OHM did the application. We used them for the application. Uh, and uh, this is their uh, proposal. Uh, they are uh, one of our uh, engineers uh, of record, uh, and uh, they've submitted this proposal. That's a hard number, the 
2,500. Uh, if there were to be any uh, additions to that, they would have to come back to us and come back to you. We um, historically have not had that issue, so. But we would like to keep this moving. Oh, that is terrific. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions about it? Other than that, I'd like to wait it tonight. So I will say you keep things moving on. We've talked about it for a while. So. All right. That's all I have on close streets and drainage and uh, 708. Thank you. Thank you. Resolution number 23001. Opening, opening Law and Ordinance Committee at 709, uh, Ordinance number 23001. An ordinance to amend Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the New Franklin Zoning Code and declaring an emergency. What we covered earlier in the presentation. We're going to ask for time on this? Yes. Yeah. Do you want me to do it? If I may. Uh, Terry was kind enough to give me a heads up uh, before the meeting that um, we were in error. <clears throat> and I like the collective we when it was my fault. <laughs> because I'm going to put this together. Uh, and I included the language about declaring an emergency. Based on previous conversations, I anticipated kind of go three readings on this, but I wanted to then, in the event, whatever action you take, that it would be effective at that point. Our, uh, Terry pointed out to me that our um, charter uh, does not permit um, the uh, emergency uh, zoning uh, issues to go by emergency. However, uh, so we, we, we're going to move to delete the and declaring an emergency. Uh, and then also uh, we won't need section four, which talks about the emergency. Because under our code, uh, under our charter, section 508, the following ordinances or resolutions take effect uh, upon passage. And among those, there's six of them listed. Or, and the fifth one says approval of a revision, codification, recodification, or rearrangement of ordinances. So in this case, we don't need the emergency language. Uh, if and when this ever passes, uh, or is rejected or modified, or whatever, it'll be effective. That action will be effective immediately. Uh, and we don't need the emergency language. So what, what correction in the actual ordinance? Uh, correct me. Just the. Uh, <coughs> And declaring an emergency. That's the only thing. Well, That's the only thing in the title. Three, section three, section and then you're going to have to strike section three. Section three in its entirety. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually. Uh, yeah, we can keep provided that this. Uh, yeah, you can you just the first sentence will be uh, deleted. The second sentence, sentence is uh, accurate. And that's accurate, yeah. So just the first, just the first sentence. sentence of section three. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Good catch. Yes, very much so. And we have um, supplemental agenda, first reading resolution of the 23R74. Now, so she needs, she needs to close this yeah. Just oh, closing the uh, uh, laws and ordinance committee at uh, 711. Thank you very much. I hold you up. I didn't mean right. Now we're going to have this supplemental agenda now. Yep. The resolution number. Uh, is it your I know. I'm just going to read the number. Oh, the number. Resolution <laughs> number 23R74. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. Uh, we will open uh, community development at 7-Eleven. Um, and I've actually got two. I've got this and then a third reading. So the first reading is uh, 23R74, a resolution authorizing payment to jank, junk away for services rendered at the site cleanup in New Franklin and improving a then and now purchase order for the junk away invoice in the total amount of $15,100 in the clearing of the so this is our famous property that uh, uh, I give the mayor a lot of credit for going through the difficult processes that we have to go through to get out and clean up the property that's been a nuisance property for a long time. And uh, it was a costly one. That, yeah, it was. That cost will go to his, uh, to, to the, how's that work? We'll be going to court. We didn't, uh, 
I, I, we didn't know how much we were going to run into, uh, so we didn't expect it to be over the ten thousand, which is it. so that's why we, we we're bringing this to you at this point in time. Um, we did seek out a, a number of vendors potentially to help us with this, and, and so many of them either didn't want it or weren't available. Uh, but these folks came in and did a really good job, and there was just so much uh, consistent with their proposal that the number went to where it was. The action that we took uh, was consistent with a, a court order that we had, and, and this is a case that was filed back in 2018, uh, and uh, this is our second time in. Um, so we will be going back to court for uh, an, an award of costs, uh, and we'll be including this number. Uh, in, in our request to the court, which you expect that they, hope that they would grant. So during the award of costs, how do, how do, what's the enforcement for being paid back on that? Well, if we, if we, if we get a judgment, it would it likely end up a lien. Okay, so I was going to as far as going back, can we just assess this property? Yeah, we're, we're gonna, we, we talked about that, but we want to be, we would prefer to have a court order yeah. in this circumstance. There's an argument, you, 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 there's a, we could conceivably just assess, mm -hmm. but I think given the, uh, the dimension here, plus we want to bring this back to the court's attention, what we had to go through, right. because we hope this is the last act, but if not, then we'll have a continuing record with the court. So we've had multiple orders from the court on this. The most recent one was the one that allowed us to go back in based upon the failure to, to uh, uh, comply with the previous orders of the court. So that's why we think it's just a little tired to bring it and get the court's approval. <coughs> and then get a judgment out of there and then the judgment will go as a, as a lien against right. the property. So that was just going to be my next question is, as long as we can make sure it's tied to the property, that right. way we're sure to get our, our funds. Absolutely. We'll record the judgment as a lien against the property. Right. Thanks. Have we done that in the past? Yes. So there are liens out there for the property? Yeah, not, yeah, we did assessments the first time. Yeah, because it was a yeah. smaller number. Yeah. yeah. And this is this is not going to be the toll of the of the lien because this is just one part of the right. cost. We had done the cost and so there's more to it. We'll present all of the court by motion. There's what three four yard dumpsters and nine truck loads. I don't know if they're dump truck loads or oh, yeah, the big trucks. Yeah. A lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, by the way, this is a committee meeting, and you're welcome. If, you know, if anybody wants to interject, you're, you're welcome to. And if I may, I'll bring this to you. Uh, I just didn't want to wait two more weeks because Junkway did a fabulous job. They're a company out in the plug them, I guess, but they're out in the diner. And uh, um, at one point, they had six people on site working. Um, so it was a major, it, we took a week of their time. And uh, I wanted to, if possible, if you're comfortable with this, I'd like to get the, rest, the, the payment process rather than. To you know, wait another two weeks. That's why we got it at the last minute. Because I just got the, well, really, we just finished up Monday, right. uh, and we just got the invoice uh, yesterday. I'm okay with waiting the three. Yes. Anybody have any issues with that? Okay. Um, all right. Any other comments, questions, concerns? Okay. Uh, moving on to our third reading, uh, resolution 23R68. Uh, resolution authorizing a collaboration of policing services between the city of New Franklin and Springfield Township in declaring this emergency. Um, this is the third reading, um, and we had quite a few questions at the beginning. Chief Pickett has done a nice job, I think, of answering uh, the preliminary questions. Then we got into uh, some questions and discussion about um, if there were an injury, workers' comp case, how that would how that would quite play out. And my understanding of the resolution of that is that the other department, in this case it'd be Springfield, would be writing a check to the officer directly? Or whoever, they, whoever they're engaged by. Um, so if it's a private enterprise that they're working for. So whoever they're working for, that's who they're working for. And that's they, they get paid directly from that person. And it, it was really, I'm really, really glad you asked those questions and they came up you know, through council because <coughs> I hadn't really thought that through before. Uh, and we took it to the point and we sent, gave it to our HR and HR took it down to uh, um, New York. Where? Group F. Yeah. yeah. And we got the answer from Columbus. So, yeah, I think, I think we probably want to be cognizant of who's paying the officers. Yeah. So we don't. Forward because, yeah. 
I, I had some residents reach out and ask him, is inquiry is like, are we doing this because we have too many offices? And I don't know, this this is on their own time. You know, they just had, had various concerns. And if I spoke to the chief about it, he had a bunch of good feedback as he did with his emails and stuff. And one of my other concerns was one of the locations in Springfield that typically it seems to be problematic. And, you know, chief, you can speak to this if you like, but I mean, essentially that was going to be kind of off the table from my understanding. Yeah, really any uh, extra job request I get, either in town or from a, a neighboring jurisdiction, it's going to come to my desk with a request. I'll look at it and I'll either approve or deny it. Um, so there's going to be some that can approve, some that can deny. It just depends on what the job is and, you know, many different factors. If it's um, the liability, liability of the city, the availability of backup, the availability of resources, um, there's a slew of reasons why I would, I would approve or deny one. But, one other question I guess I want to make sure I got clear is is the way you explained it the request would come to you you would right. assess it and say okay you know they're having a bummer of music festival over here on the <coughs> road we're not going to do that you know, something, you know, something that's out of line um, but then is this would, would it still be up to the individual officer to say yes or no no okay no. so they would be they would be no, to do what happens is it comes to me first, and we have a set rate. They can't, the, the, the pay scale is not negotiable. Right. Um, I, I then print out this, like a sign up sheet and put it on the bulletin board, and the officer can sign up. But if it's not approved, then everybody gets the board. And then everybody know about it. What if nobody signs up? Well, then I, I'll let that chief know, and then never has one. Okay, so so, so they, they are not, no, nobody is going to be forced into no it. That's, that's it. Yeah, there's no obligation. Absolutely. If an individual officer doesn't want to do something we're not forcing it and this is something that we use too like just this weekend we have we have a marathon on saturday and a triathlon on sunday so we sure. have barber and officers come and help us with traffic and you know it's just something that you know it's a you know, professional almost obligation to help each other out when there's more jobs than there are officers so yeah. you know it's, it's something we have to do with the camp and they don't solicit their own off duty stuff do they can they come to you and say i got an offer to do this or is it got to go to you before they even get to them you know, if someone comes to them and asks them, it still has to come to me first. Then I'll, I'll contact the chief and get, kind of get the scoop of what it is. Um, then I'll, I'll either approve the better or not. So they, they, they can do that. That might happen, but it's still going to go to you. Right. 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 Yeah. I'm yeah. comfortable with this now. After, after all the, uh, we, we really haven't had a lot of discussion tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with how the discussion went. I appreciate your effort there, Chief Wiggins. I was just going to interject. We, we would probably be coming to you um, with a uh, some uh, modification of the off duty, you know, the, the, the pay rate that we uh, that we charge for these off duty. We're, we're below market, mm -hmm. um, so we're we're going to try to uh, raise that up to be consistent with what other departments are doing. But we'll bring that to you uh, soon. Do you have that number now? I do not. Right now, the pay rate for the officers is thirty dollars an hour. I mean, 35 for traffic control. Um, I called probably every department I can think of in the area, and we were the lowest. Um, the average is probably about 37, um, and they're as high as 52. Um, do, do we want to, if you have a number, we can adjust it now and just pass it as amended? <coughs> um, well, this one is specific to Springfield. I think we're going to bring, I, I, I'd rather bring you a separate resolution, but I'll try to have something with the next week. But I appreciate that thought. Yeah, did you have a question? I was just going to let the opposite. So oh. when I had the Summit County Sheriff's at the upper deck, um, we paid $40 an hour, plus there was an additional fee for their website because we had to go through the website. So okay. it was about $42, I think, an hour. Okay. This, this just authorizes us to be able to do it. We can set the rate. And, and I'd just like to say, this is uh, specific to Springfield, right. uh, but we've been doing this for many years. Yeah. Our officers have been helping out other other communities uh, for, for many years, and I think it's great that we had this opportunity to go through the process and, and, yeah. and think about any concerns that may be coming up as the mayor said, I thought it through completely. So so this worked out to be a, a great thing for us to take the time. And this is the third reading on it, so uh, even though it's listed as an emergency, uh, we did take the time, and uh, we got the, the questions answered for everybody, so. Yeah. It is good. Anybody have anything else? All right, so we're going to vote tonight. All right. Um, closing community development at 722.
Does anyone else have anything else? Yeah, I'd like to call to order the City of New Franklin regular meeting on September 6th at 7.23. Can I stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Present. Mr. Gardick? Present. Mr. Argett? Present. Mr. Jones? Present. Mr. Daniels? Here. Mr. Powell? Here. Mr. Webb? Present. Mr. Stock? Here. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the regular scheduled meeting of August 16th. Second. We have a first and a second, Kelly. Mr. Gardick? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mr. Daniels? Mr. Powell? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. Mr. Cox? Yes. Is there any public comment? Anything that anyone would like to say? Yes, Ms. Terry. Terry Cruz, Life Sport for Yates Center. Um, just a comment on the zoning code changes that you're going to be addressing tonight. Um, I understand uh, what Mr. Daniels said earlier about that he, the zoning is supposed to be primarily a reorganization and a clarification and not a whole lot of procedural changes and the shortening of the public notice is a definite procedural change. Even if you just go to 14 days instead of 10, that still cuts it in half, which you know, still speeds up the process but gives people a little bit more leeway with the way the mail runs, with the way notices go out. Uh, to get public notice on things. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Our first reading resolution number 23R72. A resolution renewing the designation of JP Morgan Chase Bank as a depository bank for the city of New Franklin for a five year period and declaring an emergency. This resolution is assigned to the Finance Committee to be moved to waive the three readings on Resolution 23R72. Sir. We have a first and a second, Kelly. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Powell? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. Mr. Cox? Yes. Mr. Hargett? Yes. We move to adopt Resolution 23R72. Sir. We have a first and a second. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Powell? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. Mr. Cox? Yes. Mr. Hargett? Yes. Motion passes. Resolution number 23R73. A resolution authorizing New Franklin to enter into an agreement with OMH Advisors to provide engineering and bidding services for the Overture Way Culvert Improvement Project and declaring an emergency. I've discussed in the uh, during our committee meetings. I'd like to make a motion to move the three readings on uh, this resolution. Second. We have the first and the second coming. Mr. Daniels. Yes. Mr. Powell. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Stock. Yes. Mr. Cox. Yes. Mr. Hargett. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to adopt resolution 23-R-73. Second. We have the first and the second coming. Mr. Daniels. Yes. Mr. Powell. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. Mr. Cox? Yes. Mr. Hargett? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Motion passes. Resolution number 23001. Uh, Law and Ordinance Committee would like to ask for time on resolution number 23001. Time is asked and time is due. I guess I got a question too. This shouldn't be written as a resolution number, it should be an ordinance number. I have it on the minutes as an ordinance. Okay. I see. I made a mistake on the agenda. Because he did call it an ordinance, and I'm like, yeah. well, it's it's a resolution earlier. And I'm like, it is actually an ordinance. You are correct. Right. Yeah. It is <laughs> correct on the minutes. Resolution number 23R74. Uh, this resolution was given to the Community Development Committee. Uh, and I would like. No, I'm sorry. It's okay. That's like the third time. Yeah, you know what? Three times is <laughs> I don't think you're really doing anything unless you do it three times. 
a resolution authorizing payment to junk away for services rendered at a site cleanup in New Franklin and approving a then and now purchase order for the junk away invoice in the total amount of $15,100 and declaring an emergency. Now, this resolution was given to the Community Development Committee and I would like to make a motion to waive the three readings on resolution 23R74. Second. We have a first and a second come. Mr. Webb? Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. Mr. Cox? Yes. Mr. Hargett? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Powell? Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. I make a motion to adopt resolution 23R74. Second. We have a first and a second come. Mr. Webb? Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. Mr. Cox? Yes. Mr. Hargett? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Powell? Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. Motion passes. Resolution number 23R68. A resolution authorizing a collaboration of policing services between the City of New Franklin and Springfield Township and declaring an emergency. This resolution was brought to the Community Development Committee and I move to adopt Resolution 23R68. Second. I have a first and second. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Powell? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. Mr. Cox? Yes. Mr. Hargett? Yes. Motion passes. Now our team report of the whole program. What can I say, Paul? This is your the mayor's report. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, we want to thank uh, uh, council persons Judy Jones and Kevin Powell for feeding us. Uh, they put a be beautiful spread on last Thursday. Unfortunately, I had a lunch in downtown, which wasn't near as good as uh, all the reviews I got from the lunch that took place up here. Kevin cooked and it was scrumptious. Well, it, it was very, very much appreciated, husband. all the way across the board. <laughs> so we thank you for that. Oh, it was delicious. Uh, and uh, we also want to thank, um, and I'll, I'll reference Mr. Powell again, and then all of our department heads for a successful touch of truck. I was out of town. Um, I missed all the good stuff. I missed the pancake breakfast too. But uh, and again, it was well attended, and we really appreciate the efforts uh, there as well. So that was uh, another. Uh, it, it's not really about PR; it's about you know, community. yeah, community. It is PR yeah. community. Yeah. If you think about it, it's So we appreciate that. Um, we uh, at five o'clock today uh, honored uh, Larry Gramps Gray. Uh, and we uh, took some photographs and we're going to do a press release so we can help the press with that one. Uh, and uh, named the, uh, dedicated the pavilion there at uh, Sisler to Larry Ray, who's been a long, long, long time member of our Parks Commission and has been uh, in, down in the dirt uh, helping with projects around, uh, in, particularly the ball field, but not just the ball fields, uh, starting at Lockhart where he grew up. Yeah. Uh, and forever, if there was anything that was needed done, equipment, manpower, expertise, it was Larry. So we were really happy to uh, dedicate that pavilion at Sisler today to uh, Larry Ray. We didn't publish it ahead of time. We wanted to surprise him. I think we did. Uh, we did. Yeah. Council was you know, They were all here. Everybody was there. And uh, very much appreciated. It was a great, great afternoon. Uh, all right. Uh, I met in uh, Columbus uh, on August 22nd with... Um, Deputy Director Minda, uh, Mindy Banky from ODNR, uh, and also with uh, Michael Frazier at the uh, Ohio Department of Development relative to the sewer projects. And, and so just to, uh, uh, I guess I'll fold in also then, I, I met August 30th with uh, Senator Christina Roeder about those same projects. And uh, uh, it has to do with uh, primarily the sewer on State Route 93, project that's over there on the wall, the post sanitary sewer uh, that came to us around 2018. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, uh, the only phase of it that's currently being considered is to the, the pump station that's going to be required to get the sewage to the barber and wastewater treatment plant on Vanderhoof. And then an extension of that, that run the lines up to 
Manchester Road, State Route 93 on Vandercoast, and then run them south down to Grace Church is where gravity stops. So that's really the first phase. Uh, that's the first introduction of sewer, other than a couple of package plants to New Franklin. Um, that part of it is, that's an $18 million project. Uh, and uh, I don't mean to keep repeating myself, but I think it's helpful that, you know, for people to grasp that. Uh, we do have $3 million, that we were able to secure $3 million in federal money towards that $18 million. Summit County's dedicated $3.5 million to it. Uh, we have filed an application with Ohio Public Works, which uh, probably at best is maybe another million. Uh, and our meeting with uh, the Department of Development was to gather the other $11 million. Uh, it was a productive meeting. Um, the, there are going to be funds available, but everybody's chasing them, but we're out there chasing them too. Uh, and uh, there were some good ideas brought in terms of how much they might be able to do, uh, given their you know, from Clean Ohio funds, uh, where we might be able to go with capital grant money, where we might be able to go with principal forgiveness money, those types of things. So. Uh, we are we're in hot pursuit of that phase um, and those discussions with the Department of Development. What we're calling phase three, there's a package plant on Zellray that will become a pump station. Uh, and by itself, that really doesn't expand sewer. Uh, it, uh, the, 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 those neighborhoods are already sewer. Uh, but uh, that is at capacity right now, can't accept any additional flow. When they turn that into a pump station, then it can accept additional flow. Uh, and uh, the additional flow that we're most interested in would be from the ODNR Visitor Center, which was the purpose of my visit with them. Um, the timeline on this, it, it just gets more interesting the more conversations you have because ODNR is help, help, hopeful to have that visitor center in by the end of 2025, which I used to think that was way off. Uh, that's like, yeah. Uh, so yeah, wow, well, I was right. Because <laughs> so, that's not going to happen until phase three is done, and phase three is not going to happen until phase one and two are done. So the, the ticket on phase three to convert that package plant to a pump station, and they're actually going to run lines probably up the uh, uh, the, the State Park Road, um, is a little bit over $10 million. So those were the conversations that I had. Our target is, is the capital money for that. Um, and, and we had that conversation recently with uh, Senator Rogner. I've got a, uh, uh, a Zoom call tomorrow with uh, Representative Romer uh, and also another uh, uh, individual from uh, the House um, and uh, uh, to pitch it to them as well. There's going to be about $700 million in funding available. Uh, there's a variety of funding sources, but there's going to be 700 million available for projects that uh, are similar to appropriations, or what they used to call landmarks. So we're going to be trying to get uh, money from the Senate and from the House towards that 10 million. Um, the argument's well received because uh, uh, we've got a million dollars. The final phase is, the, is to get the line to the ODNR Center, and that's sewer and water, $3 million, and we've got a million dollars of that in federal money, you know, assuming the appropriation gets approved, which we expect it will. So we've got that money floating around. So we've had conversations, ODNR will be a partner in, in that $3 million. We've had some conversations with St. Luke's, they're interested uh, in becoming a financial partner in that. Uh, but it really is a sequential project. None of those things happen unless it all happens. Uh, and maybe as important as anything else, uh, is um, the uh, integrity, uh, uh, the water quality of the Portage Lakes. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the ultimate beneficiaries of this whole project. Uh, you know, the effluent from the uh, package plant goes to the lake. Uh, it's tested daily. Uh, and I'm pointing at Mr. Powell, I think, but, you know, and, and so, and we trust that it's well tested, but still. Uh, and, you know, so, uh, we've got, it's, uh, there's a lot of reasons why we need this, and uh, it really checks a whole lot of boxes, and so I just want to keep council advised, uh, and I'll let you certainly know when it's time to pour us in with us on these things. Um, so we're, we're chasing vigorously, to chase that, that funding, and when I said that, you know, when ODNR said it's got to be done by 2025, I said, well, good. Let's just, let's just get this done. Uh, and why not? So we're going to find out. Uh, 
All right, let's see. Um, uh, property taxes, and you know, it's, it's on the headline, and the valuations are up. A lot of people got letters. Um, we are told that um, I, I was contacted by a, a business owner on State Route 93 who did have a preliminary discussion with the fiscal office uh, that was uh, fruitful. Uh, and uh, they said, listen, you know, tell us about it. And, and one of the things that was important to them was that they don't have sewer, even though it's in what you would think is maybe a commercial corridor. Uh, and, uh, and so the individual, I'm told that the individual from the fiscal office suggested if there was some type of a letter to indicate how long it might be, that that might result in the lowering of the uh, appraised value. So I did put a letter together um, and uh, suggesting what the timelines we think along the route. You know, I'd love to have 93 done by, by 2025. Um, we have, as you know, there's business owners from Grace up to Nemesilla and around the corner that would really like to have sewer also. And when we get this part put in, and we've got some pricing on that, and when we chase this money successfully, we'll chase that money, but 2026, 2027, probably, if, if everything went really well, so I expressed that in the letter. And, uh, um, and then we have business over, so on uh, 619 also, and um, you know, it, it, best case scenario, probably 2026. So I'm sending that letter out, and I'm gonna, we're gonna send it to all our business people on those routes, that if you can use it, good. Uh, it, you know, if it helps you get a, a fair uh, appraisal, then uh, we hope it's helpful to you. Um, but uh, the, the other thing, that I, the other takeaway from that is that the fiscal office will listen to you. Uh, and uh, they're interested, you know, it's, if you got a private appraisal, of course that's what's best. If you can show some comps, some comparable sales in your neighborhood, uh, they'll consider that. Uh, and, uh, or if you have an issue like this, if you have some particular issue, um, so I would I encourage anybody who's, who's not comfortable with that appraised value to, to make the effort. Uh, and they are, they're having these public meetings and they've added one more locally. It's going to be a week from today in Barberton from 1 o'clock to 8 p.m. And I put that on the website today. So we'll be on our Facebook page and the contact information. They, uh, they say that you have to have an appointment. I've talked to them. Apparently they're, they're dealing with walk-ins too. Uh, so uh, all the information, it's a week from today, from 1 o'clock to 8 o'clock, out here in Barman, uh at somewhere. Uh, the Barberton, uh let's see, Barberton Active Adult Center at 500 West Hopkinton. That's the next one. <coughs> all right. Um, our code is in. Ooh. So some light reading for everyone. Uh, I put a copy back in the, in the council room, uh, but we're good, we need to take a look through this, and I'm getting a digital copy, and I'll, I'll, I'll get a digital copy to everybody. Most of what, the, there's, there's very little that is, uh, the, there's two or three things I want to bring to council's attention that are probably going to require some tweaking, uh, because for the most part, we have a limited number of ordinances, criminal type of ordinances. Or those types of things, uh, and uh, and there are some areas that we had considered ordinances and didn't adopt ordinances. All right, so I'll give you a heads up on ones that I think that you might want to, you know, that that would be. We'll put it this way: that would be new to us. Okay, uh, so I'm going to send that out to you, so you'll be able to take a look at the body of them. Uh, this is just a book right now. Uh, it's it's nothing until council approves it and adopts it. And so during this time, if we have some tweaking to go along, we can still do that. I don't think there's, I did a page by page review on it and we did a lot of tweaking already. So I don't think there's a lot that you're gonna be bothered by or concerned about, but we'll take our time with it. Um, I kind of want to get it done then. I thought, well, you know, we've been waiting 17 years. So we can, we can wait. If it takes a little time to do this, we can, okay? Uh, and I'll get you the digital copy. And, uh, um, uh, but it's going to be a nice piece. Uh, one of them. Question? No. Well, I was just going to mention when we are done, then that will be on our website. Exactly. Yes. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more about it at length. But I mean, the charter, there's a lot of information here that's, you know, that people, well, what you can find in every other city. Exactly. 
that you can't find. But you're going to be able to find it. Uh, we, I'm, you know, by the end of the year, you know, I, I would expect us to be in a position to, uh, to get this approved. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Just a couple last things. Music Night is next Tuesday. Uh, Opus 216, they are a string quintet, and they're fabulous. Everything from Brahms to the Beatles. Uh, and they uh, tell great stories, and they're well-received. So that's our final music night, Tuesday, 7 p.m., over at the Tudor House. Uh, second to last thing is um, there's a change coming effective October 3rd. Uh, it was um, passed by uh, uh, the state reps. Uh, that is going to increase the threshold for mandatory bidding from 50000 to 75000 for municipalities. So uh, just what it says, uh, it, it, you know, less of a bidding requirement. Uh, so we'll keep you surprised with that. And finally, um, this process, and I, I thought Mr. Gray did a nice job, but, and, uh, uh, but as he mentioned, keeping these things in the, you know, moving down the track, I mean, it, it takes a long time. <coughs> We're in September now. Uh, and so he said it was going to take a year. I'm sure it will. Uh, so the next phase, uh, and they're moving along, and that's going to include the RL districts, and I know there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, and there will be a workshop tomorrow evening right here, uh, Thursday, 6 p.m. Uh, to 6 begin 30. 6 30 p.m., thank you. Uh, to begin discussing um, the, uh, the, the any proposed revisions to the RL district. Um, all I know about well, I, I, this is all I know about that one is that, as Fred pointed out, that he did a nice job in his diagnostic report. That the number of variances that have been granted, that have been applied for, and almost universally granted, uh, it's the the bulk of what's of what planning and zoning and BZA has done. You know, and so it's more of my idea. Of, it's not to necessarily to try to change things. You know. But it's really to bring it into conformity with what people are already doing. So, but you know, I'm not plugging it. It's a, it's here for the public to digest and process, and it'll go through that same process. This is just a workshop. Eventually, there, there may be another workshop, or or eventually it'll go to a public hearing, uh, in planning and zoning, and then eventually it'll come here to council and I'll take that same process again. So there'll be plenty of time to uh, be able to consider those issues. Uh, and that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, no, the only other member that's here right now is Mary. Um, my understanding, we're just waiting for them now. Uh, it's basically all all heavy lifting has been done. Uh, Paul, have you heard anything about? What no, I have not. But I'll make a note to do that. And I I I, I did want to point out. I hope you you know that. Um, I'll make that call to, to Lauren. Um, that would be the first time I've talked to her in a long time. Uh, and uh, I, I just, I guess I want everybody to know that, uh, that we've tried to be, not we've tried to be a standoffish and as far removed administration as we could possibly be on this and let this be the work of the community and the work of the, uh, you know, of the, of the uh, commission themselves. So, but uh, I was thinking about that the other day too. It seems like we ought to have it by now. So I'll get a hold of her tomorrow and find out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't mind sending that email too, or, or ask Mike. Ask, ask. I'll, I'll, I'll do it and I'll copy Mike and, okay. and, and, and push that. So, All right. If you're doing this, copy me. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Good. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work perfectly. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, I think I think the process has gone pretty well to this point. Um, of course, we're waiting to see that finished product and. and Everybody's kind of hoping we're not going to be surprised by anything, but I, I don't think we will based on what's, what's going on. So, Barry, do you have anything to add? No, I think you're right. I'm going to wait. Thank you, Jerry. Susan? I um, just want to let you know a few things. Um, our audit is almost finished, so you'll be hearing about that. Yeah, we'll be happy about that too. Yeah. Um, but I did want to, one thing that was brought to my attention, um, I know you all did your fraud. Uh, questionnaires and I think some people had a little bit of questions or maybe um, didn't know exactly what that all entailed so I kind of wanted to give you a little synopsis so that you understood it a little better there's a couple 
um, parts to it. One is fraud itself, and the other is the related party questions. And that was the reason why they needed to have for counsel where you worked, what businesses you own, that kind of thing. And we're going to have to keep up with those kinds of things because, and this is the thing they're, che they're checking, it's not just an ethics violation, but it's considered under the fraud package, that if you are, and it's not just council members, employees, board members, and their family members cannot do business with the city is a violation. And that's what they're checking, and that's why they want to see that through the audit process. So that's, I just kind of wanted to let you know, and as Susan <coughs> Wilkie says at the Ethics Commission, she says, residents have the right to expect that the city is doing its due diligence to find vendors at the lowest and best prices, and that it's through fair business, you know, practices and not just a friend of, you know, your your buddy or somebody that works here or your son-in-law or whatever. I, I wanted to ask one of those questions and then I remember that it was an <coughs> answer then did I not follow up? Do I owe, do I owe I think so I want to Just the last one. Um, I asked where I, you know, what I did where I worked. Actually, they told me they had everything because um, I know they told somebody where you worked because they had your business. Well, I, all mine is just closed on the ethics, on the Ohio ethics. Right, right. and they that's actually, took it from. yeah, and actually I think that's where they took it Good. from ultimately. That was but basically they, what I was asking. Yeah. yeah, but the problem was that they had to actually go ask them and they put in like a public records request oh, to right. get that. So it wasn't like okay. they would just tell them, you know. Over so in the future, they'd probably be okay with me just forwarding that Ohio ethics uh, report to yes. them. That's yes. Yes. It just finds yes, and also they've said that we and at the office need to have that information as well, not because we're you nosy, know, but because when we're when the departments and and the, we are choosing vendors, we have to know that you know it's not one of your companies, so that we don't put you in a bind because it wouldn't put you in a bind more than you in the city. Um, you know that we know that we've done what we're supposed to do our due diligence. The other parts of fraud are what you expect. Um, there are certain places in the city where we know that fraud would have a higher likelihood, and those would be places where there's a lot of cash gamble. Um, stuff like budget or house events. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, the service department, because they do cemeteries, they do permits and things of that nature. So we do have practices and procedures to to reduce the likelihood of fraud in all those instances. And they're constantly changing depending on what, you know, electronic payments and things of that nature. So we're updating them constantly. So we do have these things in, in mind. One of the major things that we've done for years and years are overlapping of duties in our department so that no one person is just handling the cash or handling the deposits or checking the receipts. So in our department, that's that's a key thing of overlapping duties. But the other thing is, is the receipt process itself. For example, I'll just give you an example. Let's say Brian brings us $50 for a road opening. Um, he has to receipt the people that he gets that money from. We have duplicate receipts. We all have them when they say we frank on them. Um, then he brings that, his copy of that receipt to our office with the money. And then we write a receipt back to Ryan showing that we got him, got that receipt from him for that amount. And then that's put into our system. And then when we do the bank reconciliations, then that verifies that <coughs> that's the amount that actually was deposited and that you know backs up all those things. So there are procedures that that handle that. I know a lot of people don't like you know some of the paper, but sometimes in, in receipts, for example, that's absolutely necessary because we can't do those double checks. We have, as you know, gone electronic with a lot of things, um, which has helped too, and we have um, we have ways to um, check that as well because we do get, from the merchant services, we do get um, their verifications that the payment is gone through. Um, we also get a monthly report on that, and that is that is put up against the receipts that we enter into the system, as well as our bank reconciliation. So there's a lot of things that we do internally to try to mitigate any chance of fraud. And I just wanted you to kind of be a little bit more aware of that. 
If you have questions about that, please ask us. Um, and if you have ideas or whatever, we're constantly trying to update things and to make it. Um, I mean, we don't have that problem. We haven't had to you know, take anybody to court. We haven't had this problem. But we want to make sure that it stays that way. And we want to make sure that everybody feels like um, that their money is safe because this money that's here in the Frank that belongs to all the residents. And we want them to know that we're doing our due diligence and that they don't have to be afraid that something terrible will happen. So I just kind of wanted to bring you up to speed on that. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Susan, thank you. That was enlightening. That was very nice. Thank you for doing that. No problem. Does anyone have anything for old business? I've got a couple of things. One, just to kind of build on what the mayor said about the Tusser truck, it was a great event. I think we had between four and 500 people pass through there. It was very well attended. Mm -hmm. Thanks again to you know, Chief Beckett and you know, the Assistant Chief Young and Chief Leslie and Brian and everybody. I mean, it, it went very well. It set the bar for what we can try to be better than next year. It went very well. The pancake breakfast, once again, it was well attended, I thought. It just turned out to be a great, great day. Uh, second thing I wanted to ask about is uh, we we had uh, given permission to pursue a grant for design on the Route 619. Uh, we won't, that, that won't uh, open until January. Right, but we're, we're looking at going down that, that path to get funding to do a design and stuff. Yeah, Correct. yeah, just to see, yes. Yes. So my, my question, I was, I was out there looking around, just kind of trying to visualize this, because after reading the, the Believer article and stuff, just kind of reflected back on that. If we're looking at putting the third lane there, just looking at where, where does that fit in there as far as existing width and how does that change as far as <coughs> properties and are we, you know, it, this this is just a whole ball of wax that you start finding. You're know, looking at are we doing you know, property takes or you know how does that build in there? And then is this just a new Franklin project or is this a project coupled with, coupled with say green or something for the whole corridor? How does that look? And I. Those are just some questions that I had as I'm out there yeah. trying to visualize how this whole thing comes together. And, and where that led to was if we're potentially changing that whole look of that corridor through there. I mean, just the thought that I had, <clears throat> it'd be nice to see council kind of put together a committee of constituents that they think may have you know, stakeholders, if you will. Sure. Say if, if each one of us pick two or three people to go on this committee to kind of have uh, a meeting with a consultant. I know they picked the consultant. It would be nice to have a meeting with that consultant prior to the, the pencil hitting the paper for the first time, just to get a concept and idea of what we're looking at, or what we think we'd like to see out there. Yeah, and I think it, it, um, it's, you'll find that's exactly what I said when I brought it up mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. That it, it absolutely would involve stakeholders. Okay, um, so it was. It actually came. The idea was, was brought to me more than me bringing the idea. Uh, you know, from Amats and, and meeting with their director, you know, we had talked about some possibilities, but uh, you know, a couple of things happened. One is the traffic uh, study showed that that's a high volume, and we hit. We we, we made the list of which a list you don't really want to be on of accidents, uh, and so and that opens the door to funding. Uh, <coughs> so the notion was, what if you know? And I think it was a forward-looking thing. I have no idea about widths or anything else at this point in time. I saw, you know, I saw an artist's rendition of what this might look like, you know, maybe a third way. And I can see that in the event that there's development there, um, that why a third, why a term name would make sense. But, you know, Mr. Paul, I don't know what'll come out of that, uh, you know, the, the people that are paid, you know, to do this for a living, they may look at that and say, that's not practical, yeah. that you don't need that. But I want to make it clear, this is not, the administration's agenda. This this would like all things like this would be entirely a community project. Okay. okay? And I just want to make sure that we we say that publicly. Yeah. And I'll say it again because yeah, yeah, I said it two weeks ago, right. and I'm gonna say it again tonight. Okay. I'm just Same thing I said two weeks ago. So just, this is gonna be a team effort, a collaborative. I want property owners involved. I want council involved. If we have people in the public that are interested, jump on board. Okay, and the more not you, know, it's got to have to be practical, of course. And I talked about it. I don't mean to keep cutting you off, but but I mean that's the way you know that's the way it was. That's that's the first thing that I said. Okay, 
And then when I brought it to you, I said the same thing. And so I'm, I'm fully in accord with you on that. That's that's the way I would envision it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I got, I got a couple. Uh, first, I want to reiterate what Mr. Powell just said. And, and it really, the, uh, it wasn't at the meeting two weeks ago. I, I did watch it. And, um, you know, it really brought a lot of ideas. I have thought for years that we have underappreciated that corridor. Um, there's there's a lot there. Obviously, there's a lot of traffic there. There's a lot of lakefront. There's a lot of commercial lakefront. Um, you know, it, it's it's an important corridor. I I I fear a big a big widening. I, I fear uh, a change of the character of the flow of that. It does. It's not a fast moving corridor, um, but that's kind of what it is. And and I and I I fear that when state or federal money comes in it's like all right well we got to blow this out got to have big burns you know and and here we are and then who's going to stop <laughs> you know if, if 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 we've got this nice little winding road over the river and through the woods there's an advantage to that and i hope that and, and i don't know that 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 would be their plan it's just a fear that's all yeah. so i hope that having a strong council and community stakeholders involvement in, in the early parts of that process might prevent a real fancy plan that comes out that has big visions of grandeur that then our neighbors to the east or our neighbors to the west could come and say oh look this is what amex or whoever says would be best and now here we are a little guy in the middle he's got the character we might lose the character no that the point's all well taken I, the personalities that we're dealing with, I mean, Matt's is favorable. Uh, okay. they're, not, they're not hard chargers. Um, Curtis Baker and his group, um, number one. And then number two, of course, and, you know, if we can get the, you know, if we can get them to pay for the, uh, for the plan, that's a good thing. We we'll get all the voices, you know, and then, and then the ball's back in council's court. You know, do we want to proceed? Does this make sense? You know, what, what these people are suggesting. Um, so it's it's a forward thinking thing. It would, you know, we're talking about a number of years, um, and it, it, Mr. Daniels, you you've expressed what a lot of people have expressed over the years. You know, a lot of people look over there and say, "This is what it is. What could it be?" Right. From the city's perspective, five, ten, fifteen years down the road, uh, you know, is it going to be developed? Um, do we need development? You know, some type of controlled development in those kind of corridors. Uh, if that development took the, the fashion of commercial up front and some type of residential in the back, like you see in a lot of different places, um, it, it maybe they would need a third lane. I don't know. It would it'd be probably a pretty significant revamp. Uh, uh, you know, and we've got businesses there and property owners there that want the sewer and the water. And so, so uh, it's a chance. You know, it's it's not it's a it's a real chance for us. I think to let somebody who does this for a living listen to what everybody wants right. and they say well here's what it could be and it could be two or three different proposals um so uh, i think it's an exciting thing i think and i, I appreciate the interest in, uh, yeah i think, I, think and I appreciate we got an active council thank you and i mean that uh you know that's what we need doors in the water it's not my plan i'll be gone <laughs> i'm a old guy <laughs> you know what i'm saying this is for the next generation you know this is to make sure that these guys you know, not only have a nice place, but also have police and fire and service and roads and everything else. That we can keep paying for what we're doing. Yes. Uh, that's what this is about. Everything we're talking about here, the sewer and everything else. Uh, not going crazy and building bright. How, how big can we get? It's, let's you know, let's make sure that we do something. That we make sure we got a revenue stream that we can all keep enjoying the quality of life that we enjoy out here. So, because we all know you can't do anything without money. Unfortunately. Will you finish? I, I'm done with old business. I'm okay. going to get you in. I'm going to get you in. I can rest for you. New business. All right. Uh, I have brand, brand new business. Uh, a very um, engaged city employee is apparently watching the meeting from home and knows that there happens to be a draft final comprehensive plan uh, that a couple of steering committee members, I'm guessing, Chairman, uh, have and they're giving it a quick proofread so we should have uh, our draft very soon. 
That shows you how out of touch I am with this. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you both thought it was yeah. coming. Yeah, well, I figured it was coming, but I didn't realize that, that it was. It was well, it's almost point, here, so you yeah. both thought. That's good. Um, another question, real quick. Um, will the workshop tomorrow or any of the other parts of the process through the this, this zoning change be recorded? Is, is, is Robert being invited mm -hmm. to that stuff? Because mm -hmm. I think. I think this is maybe the first part wasn't as much because it, I, I keep calling it form and manner. It's the you know the, the language and how the language mm -hmm. works. But when we start actually getting into meat, meat and potatoes, I, I think it would be a healthy thing for the city to have. To have. If not every one of them reported, at least some of them, if possible. And, and we've kind of talked about this in the past of having a, a, a system set up that makes it easy when we are having any type of uh, meeting uh, that is, is simple, user-friendly, that can turn it on and broadcast it, record it, you know, it goes to Facebook, YouTube, whatever platform. But we, we've talked about it in the past of doing something, and this is a prime example of, of why we need that, so that it, it is something that's here constantly, so user-friendly, that we can you know, record and, and broadcast Pretty much everything. I've actually recently, where I work, we got our own access cable, if you will, community television. And I've contacted them about what these materials would cost, and they're telling me that 10 to 15 range. And that would be turnkey, software, everything. 10 to 15 bucks? I don't know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm our change, David. Yeah. 10 to 15 bucks? Yeah. For Everything recording, yeah, that would be the, the, transmitting, the cameras, and set up. Yeah. It is <laughs> definitely the name of that event. It has definitely come down. We need the name of that event. I've oh. participated in a couple of things that it, it, it is so much simpler. No, I'm not saying, yeah. I, you know, my, I get limited experience with that one. It's when we travel over to Green, we do our uh, uh, COG meetings over there. I mean, they've got a control room if you've been to their council chambers. Uh, and uh, and they have whoever their tech is that comes and runs it and gives us a high sign and it's pretty nice. But uh, you know, I was thinking very expensive. Uh, not to say it's prohibitively expensive, you know. So um, we let's advance the conversation. Uh, I'm pointing to Robert. I know he's got a lot of expertise in this area. In terms of the short term, um, uh, we could, uh, I suppose. Part of the problems is the mics and everything else, I suppose, at these workshops, right? Of course, we could stick pipes there. I mean, if we wanted to, if we wanted to, um, do we want to record it so people can view it later? Do we want to transmit it live if people want to plug into it and see it live? Like they, they're watching this live, right? If they're watching, all right. Um, I think but as as they're watching it live, it's also recorded. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think? Do we want it live? I mean, can we do this? Absolutely. Okay, that's fair. Right. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to him. I'll get no, I love refresh information. Okay, beautiful. Uh, you willing to work with us on this, Robert, from a technical standpoint? Because you didn't run out the door yet. <laughs> no, obviously. Uh, not that sad. Okay, good. Well, then we'll. Uh, whether or not. Uh, can we do tomorrow? Okay. You got it. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. All right. Good yeah, point. Good idea. Um, You're kidding, I'm just shocked. <laughs> Anybody else for new business? Any public questions? And I'm assuming we can have no executive session. Right, second session. So before I ask for adjournment, our next meeting is September 20th, uh, 2023, here at 6 p.m. I'm going to ask for someone to make a motion to adjourn. adjourn. Second. Second. We have a first and a second, Ms. Kelly. Mr. Cox? No. Mr. Argett? Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mr. Daniel? Yes. Mr. Powell? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Mr. Stock? Yes. Fancy if we leave. How wonderful it was to see how many people came. It was nice to see. Oh, of course it is. So many kids.